All right, in this little session, which is only going to take about 20 minutes because we've got no time after that anyway, the bell's going to go. I just want to get through some of the really basic elements of flight. All right, now we've looked at the history stuff, you've got this perspective. Now we're going to look at what is it as an engineer in this course we are meant to know about. Now, flight is maintained, as we mentioned already, by the fact that the airflow over the aerofoil, so we go back to that design I showed you in the other morning, other day, that's an exaggeration. No airfoil is going to work like that because it'll actually cause too much problem with another thing in a minute. The airflow coming over the top creates a faster speed of air to travel the same time to meet with the air that's coming out the other side. If you don't get them to meet at the same time, what you'll finish up doing is creating a vacuum of some form behind the aircraft, which isn't good, and it's not possible to do anyway. But what you do get too is a problem when they, these two mix because they're traveling at different speeds when they come together, you can get them to bang into each other a little bit and it creates an area of turbulence. So you've got to try and minimize that too, as we'll see why. So here's two things. You've got a virtual lift as a result of the more likely to say that the air underneath is pushing up because there's less pressure above to push down. So that's where your lift's coming from. Now the other problem is that this air has to move up and over and change a little bit when you confront it. So there's going to be a problem at the front here of air being made to decide where it's going to go and you've got this issue at the back. Right, now when we were talking about friction, we were looking at friction from the perspective of a box or something on a floor and a natural movement going down as a result of gravity, but it's being held in place by a resisting force acting in the opposite direction. This aircraft is not on the ground and it's not in contact with anything other than the air. This friction was related to the interpenetration of the two materials, the roughnesses of the surfaces, if you like. But you can basically say that from here on in, what applied in friction applies in the aircraft. Friction acts against motion. This particular stuff added up acts against forward motion. You've got to push through the air and you've got to stop this, tur this turbulence attaching at the back. And that's referred to as drag. Drag is what is equivalent to, for an aircraft, friction to the box on the slope. It retards motion. Now, how do you get motion of the box on the slope? You make sure that the force is greater than the friction. All right, so you can start moving forward if you have overcome the drag in air. Second, to get up in the air, you need for the velocity of the air going over the top here to be sufficient enough to create enough lift enough lift to l overcome weight. That's terrible writing, Muriel. Uh, so weight, I'll put it the other way around, weight is due to the mass of the aircraft and gravity. Now you've got to overcome drag you've also got to overcome the mass due to gravity. If the velocity here is important in changing the pressure difference, now do you remember from the other day what the name of the guy was who came up with the principle? You wrote it down, I can look it up too. I said, did you remember it? Bellini's principle that is that if you have a fluid traveling faster, the pressure goes down. So the relationship between velocity and pressure is inverse. All right, so if you get the, the, to get the lift you need, you need velocity of air over the top to get an inverse relationship between the pressure underneath. Okay, so how do you achieve that? 
Well, the term we use for it in flight is that you have to produce thrust. Now, basically, that's it. From here on in, the discussion is going to be related to what are the conditions of thrust and drag versus lift and weight. And they are vectors. You can look at the diagram as a series of vectors that have to be counted and worked to. Lift and weight. Now, if you want to go up, then clearly your lift has to be larger than your weight. Otherwise, all you're going to do is stay at the same place. That's okay when you're at a place you want to stay. <laughs> so if you've got to the height you want to be at, then it's great because then you can back off on the velocity because you can lower the lift. That's another reason why cruising altitudes are really important to commercial aircraft. Cruising altitudes, a place at which you are only going fast enough forward to match weight and drag. Now, if you want speed and acceleration, then you've got to increase your thrust. Now, I presume all of us have been in a plane at some point, have we? Anybody here not unfortunate enough to have, or unfortunate enough never to have been off the ground yet? See, that's remarkable. As I said, when I was at school, I would not find one person who had been in a plane until I was, met this kid who'd come back from England. Right? I reckon it'd be hard pressed to go out there now and find someone who hasn't been in a plane and hasn't been in a commercial aircraft. So you've all had that wonderful experience. My wife loves this. She says it's the, it's, the, it's the point of the plane flight that she really enjoys. But it's the point of the plane flight that everybody else is white knuckled. And that's the thrust that the plane's taking off and the shake and... Uh, the well, no, this, yeah, well, she says it's the best bit too. Um, I'm too busy watching the engine shake and all the stuff going on. And, gee, I'm glad. Actually, I said to her at one stage, we were up, up again in an aircraft, we're looking out the windows and the wings are going like this. And I, she looked and I looked at her and she said, oh, and she said, is that bad? And I said, no, that's exactly what you want. It's exactly what you want. You want the flex. Of course, rigidity breaks. Flexibility. So as the wings are doing this, it's actually a good thing. Uh, so the, the more shaking and vibrating, <laughs> probably the better. Up to a point. Of course, if bolts start to fall off, that's not good. But it's that thrust, you know, that initial get going and, they, and it's right from it's like a drag race you start from scratch and you go and then you tear up and the plane a couple of times leaving Sydney you get you get a, it just sort of leaves the ground and then just goes up and, and then banks you know and you before you know it you sort of leaped off the ground and the, and the ants are getting bigger, smaller and smaller, smaller. Um, oh they're people no it's getting further and further away right? and very quickly because the plane is using the, the, the most thrust it can get at the shortest period of time to get to a cruising altitude, and then it'll tip over and sit. And on a, a trip like the simple ones, like to Sydney to, Sydney to Melbourne or Sydney to Brisbane or straight over to New Zealand, you're only going one, one thing, you're just straight up. You're not going, you might have to go around a storm or something sometime, but really it's just a straight line. So they get up there and they just turn everything back. You only just need, once you've got the speed, you stay at the speed. You, that, that's something some people can't seem to get their head around too. Remember I talked about motor car driving? When you get on the freeway, right, you get on the freeway and you get up to speed, you're 110, you've accelerated up to it. As long as your engine is overcoming friction and drag, the engine does not have to do any more work. And you get people going, but hang on, you've got to keep going to go fast. You're already going fast. All you're trying to do is stop slowing down. And it's the same with aircraft. Once you get to your flight speed, all you have to do is provide enough thrust to keep going. Overcome drag. Now, if you want to go up, you have to accelerate. If you want to go down, decelerate. Or alternatively, put some things on the wings that will stop the airflow going over the same way, and that will then slow the aircraft down as well and you can use the combination of the engine problem with jet engines they don't like to go in reverse <laughs> not in midair <laughs> they can be made to go reverse but they're not really good so what they often do um, they do a reverse thrusting system you, you, so the jet engines running in one direction so let's quickly we, we'll talk more about jet engines in another lesson but the jet is trying to come through the air here, through the funneling, through the compression, out the back. 
and that's the thrust. But what if, what if you have a system that suddenly puts a baffle down the back here so that the thrust is going up and over? So you just open a couple of flaps at the back of the engine and you can use the engine itself now as a reversing engine. Now you don't want to do that in air. So uh, you just back off on, on, the, on the thrust and make some... Is that how the planes would like reverse on the runway? Or do they actually have motors in there? No, they, the jet engines don't have motors down on the, on the wheels. So what will happen if they're reversing on the runway and it's not using the jet engine, if you look out the window, there's probably a little guy in a little car with a big steel bar attached to the front wheel of the plane doing it. <laughs> when they land and come up, they come up and they might meet these little guys in, in trucks. They put a bar on the front wheel and then they guide them and back them into things. So, yeah. Okay, this is diagram getting too confusing. Okay. Let's clear it up a bit. So lift, you've got the thrust, Lift, drag, co the stuff going on here. Right. So it's just think in future, when you're looking at drag, think about um, friction, really. Same deal. A couple of other things. No, just do this. Get rid of that. Come on. Stay there. Yeah, got it. We're good. It didn't, close. It didn't go away, though. <laughs> yes, I do want to get rid of them. I'll use the other side. No. Uh, it doesn't want to stay there. <laughs> this is turning into a comedy routine for the video. Right, Yay! okay. <laughs> cool. All right, try again. You can do a number of things with the... <laughs> Funny. Right. The aerofoil can face into the wind or into the direction that you're flying, not into the wind, it's not necessarily wind. We'll talk a little bit about directions too. If you were to tilt the wing up, so there is a change in what's called the angle of attack, what do you think is going to be the result of the airflow? Is it going to be the maximum that you get in level flight? Does it look logical? No. no. What do you think might be the result? All right. Now this can be slightly counterintuitive because it looks now like the air underneath is being squashed against the plane. But what is it directing the plane to do? The air underneath is now hitting the underside of the wing, so increasing the angle of attack up to a point. If you go too far, then the airflow over the top has not got fast enough to beat the drag being affected on the plane, and you lose the advantage, and the aircraft stalls. That's not a good thing course they just stop flying and fall out of the sky because the only thing that was keeping them up was the fact that it had lift so you don't want to go too high but you can use that now you can do things with other control things that can change those elements and you can deepen the front by having a nose that moves you can have a body and some things at the back so you can change the distance over the top and the distance underneath and even the effect of some of the angle of attack by changing the geometry of the wing. Modern aircraft do that. And you may, again, if you've been on a commercial flight and you get to sit near the wings, you can look out and you can see in landing and take off what is happening with these things attached to the back of the wings creating lift or creating drag depending upon what your opportunity what you want to do so now you're starting to introduce control structures remember i talked about the wright brothers and um, what they did with the idea of having a canard at the front that did the control for elevation and eventually they moved that to the tail and that became the 
horizontal stabilizing element for the aircraft and it would it would raise or lower the attitude of the nose of the aircraft and with wings that are fixed to the aircraft it changes the angle of attack of the wings at the same time so pointing the aircraft into the air will create some more lift but it'll also increase drag so you'll have to increase thrust so if you're a pilot you know that these combinations of things have to happen in order to keep flying and climbing you need to put the power on to compensate for the additional drag you're now getting because the angle of attack is slightly higher. Now there's something else you can get out of an aircraft too, is that if you leave it to itself to fall out of the sky, gravity acting, the wing can create a slope like a downward slope on a, like a, a, a ramp. And that ramp is just the same as if you put the box on the, the ramp. As long as the box is at an angle sufficient for it to overcome the drag, the friction, it'll slide. Now, you can go much further and you'll go faster. Now, the angle at which the aircraft just manages to start going down at a controlled rate so that the angle of the, the thrust is now not enough to create the, the lift, but the aircraft is still flying, so it's still got enough to hold it in the air. That's the glide angle, right? glide angle. Now glide angles are important too, because glide angles tell you what the aircraft will do if you lost the engine. So you've got no thrust. The only way to keep going forward is to let gravity push you. And it's sort of like using the air as a slope to come down. Now clearly, if you want to stay in the air the longest time, you want to develop an aircraft wing with a really good glide path. And gliders are designed for that purpose. And guess what? Gliders don't have an engine. They get towed up to altitude and then dropped. They are falling out of the sky. A glider is literally a falling aircraft. It's crashing, but it's extremely well controlled crash. <laughs> Right? However, if you are in some of the modern fighter jets where speed is essential to lift, you lose your speed, they do not fly. That uh, Phantom jet that I talked about, you know, the one that I said was America's proof to the world with a big enough engine and a brick will fly? Turn the engine off and it's a brick. <laughs> it doesn't fly. Um, glide path then for that is you have to point the nose down and get your acceleration up by flying straight at the ground and then hopefully you've got enough speed to pull up at the end. Do you know what other aircraft lands like that? And it's hardly an aircraft sometimes. Most of the time it doesn't operate as an aircraft. But it relies on falling out of the sky and generating lift. The space shuttle. When it comes back to Earth, it falls at a rapid rate. Once it's got through the area where it's ionizing under the, the pressure underneath, now, what I, um, I mentioned a minute ago, something we often talk about, that we, we talk about wrongly, terminal velocity. All right, terminal velocity is the speed at which you are using gravity to fall, but you can't go any faster, you can't accelerate, because the stuff you're flowing through or falling through isn't getting out of the road fast enough and it limits the acceleration. So the shape of the aircraft and the fall could determine what velocity you can reach just using gravity as an accelerator. So your thrust is coming from your own mass in the gravitational field. Right? Terminal velocity for most people, you know, like falling out of an aircraft or something, is going to be based on what shape you put yourself into. Um, you've probably seen air photographs of people who jump out of aircraft with those wing things on and do the flying part, right? So that sort of thing is using the terminal velocity to slow it down by getting air to rush out from underneath you. Um, how fast can it get a, a bullet has a nose on the front of it so it doesn't have to push through the air as much. So aircraft with pointy noses are there to stop or get higher rates of forward progression because the wind or the air is blowing over it better. There's less drag, okay? So terminal velocity is related to how fast can what you're flowing through get out of the road? Right. And gravity is still your accelerator. Okay, so back to those things. If you want to go up, 
you want to increase the angle of attack and get lift from underneath as well, but you need to compensate for the drag by increasing thrust. If you want to go down, you back off. If you want to just fly straight, just keep the thrust and the drag equal. Pretty straightforward. Now, if you lose any ability to go in forward thrust and you start to fall due to gravity, then you better hope that your plane has been designed with a really good glide path so that the pilot has plenty of time to find somewhere to land. Right. What else is there? Okay, control mechanisms we're talking about. The back end being lifted up. Um, these terms for the back section, the horizontal sections across the back of the wings, the horizontal stabilizer situation, is that when it's moved, it's an elevator. Elevator speaks of going up and down. You also have some things along the wings called aerolons that can help with another thing you want to do sometimes, which is to move the aircraft in a different attitude. Now, probably should talk about the attitudes very quickly. There are three axes when you're flying. There's the axes straight down the nose of the plane. And if you were to turn around on that axis, so let's do a stick figure aircraft, right? Stick figure aircraft. If you wanted to turn around the axis that is the middle one, this line here, that's termed roll. So you're rolling the aircraft, like a victory roll thing they talk about in some of the movies, war movies and stuff. If you want the aircraft to go from looking at it sideways, so you've got the wings here, and you want it to go up, then you're actually pitching on a axis that runs through the wing, that axis there. And that's called pitch. Pitching up, pitching down. Pitching up, pitching down. So you've got roll, pitching up and pitching down. Now when you want to turn, that rudder at the back can be made to move left or right, or whatever direction you're actually flying, whether left or right is relevant. And it moves the aircraft by having the wind or the air, I keep saying wind, the air hitting it, to push in the opposite direction just like it does on a boat. So you change the nose position relative to the tail position. And that's called yaw, when you move the nose compared to the tail. <coughs> the control mechanisms for those are the rudder at the back, those horizontal stabilizer sections to keep the aircraft float that move, called elevators, the wings that give you lift, with the additional little elements on the sides that can be independently moved to tilt the aircraft in a roll position. When you fly, if you want to maintain a relatively good attitude to the air for both wings when you're turning the aircraft, you want to roll the aircraft slightly you want to close the nose up a little bit to, to compensate for the extra drag that you're generating by turning into the oncoming air. So you pitch up or you increase thrust, one of the two, and the combination of those two things can get you to turn a corner and a relatively tight turn. These types of things were first learnt in that stuff I was talking about when I talked about World War I fighter pilots. They started to put additional aerolons onto their wings so that they could turn faster. They also realized that when you are in a turn, as you turn the aircraft, you maybe, like that was your forward direction here, now your forward airflow is coming from a different direction because you're turning into it. So this part of the wing over here is not going to hit the air at the same angle. So when you're turning, the, the fact that one part of the wing is now not going through the air as fast as the other side of the wing. So you need to adjust these things. You need these extra controls on the wings to allow for these tiny little nuances that happen when you start turning. Remember I said too, in the first one I said about the big deal, the, the military weren't going to buy into aircraft until somebody could show them that they could turn a corner. Flying in a straight line was not a good deal. 
So the Wright brothers had to come up with all these things and the other guy, Curtis, who I talked about, he cut, got there first and got the contracts because he was able to do the turns that they were looking for. Turning the aircraft is probably one of the hardest things to do in the air because as you do it, you're actually increasing drag, so you've got to be aware of all these things. If you tilt the wings and you tilt them too far, you lose lift on one wing and you get all more lift on the other wing. All right? It gets really weird when you fly a helicopter because one wing is going at the direction of the airflow and the other wing is retreating. They're actually wings, really, flying through the air. But one, so you have to, and they actually have to have on the top that little, all that control that has all these things on the sides. Basically, as they're going through the air, they're changing the pitch of the blades as they go around the corner. <laughs> so it, as it's going in, it's got one, one pitch or one angle of attack. And when it's retreating on the other side, it changes the angle of attack to compensate. So it's actually increased there and then comes around and changes again. So you don't get the plane doing this. Turn the helicopter on it, it wants to turn over. Okay. There were different solutions for that. When Skyoski came, was one of the great heli helicopter, pilot, uh, helicopter designers, he put two counter-rotating. The schnooks, yeah. And that was also to stop the, 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 the thing that happens when you've got the gyration that wants to occur when you turn a motor on and you're not actually holding it with anything. Um, the auto rotation that occurs from the motor so you have to have something on the tail end of the helicopter to stop it from spinning around on itself. Helicopters are really complex. Yeah. Pretty cool though, but they're really complex. <laughs> they're, uh, you'd much rather fly a glider because it's just go straight, turn, all these sorts of things. There's not much can go wrong in a glider. Right. <laughs> yeah, cra it's, 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 it is, it's crashing in style. Okay, so there's the main things. Now, how we're going to use these in the next few weeks is we're going to be looking at problems involving how you might use the forces that are at act and work out calculations related to what do I need to have in terms of thrust if I want a certain lift coefficient. Now, they'll talk about drag coefficients like they talk about friction and coefficient of friction. It's nothing more than making the numbers add up and it's nothing more than all the horizontal components involved have to... Um, well, if you, if you don't want motion forward and you want it to just stay where it is, not that that's happened or impossible with an airplane, you must have some airflow over the wings to get the lift. So you've always got to be moving forward in an aircraft. They don't tend to fly if you don't. So, um, yeah, like sharks, apparently. Yeah. You have to, have to have airflow through the lungs so they don't breathe. So... <laughs> There will be some calculations to do anyway. So they're the big deals. Um, I think that's about it for today. As I said, that was only just a brief introduction. There's a whole lot of notes in the, in the books um, that you've got here, in the textbook stuff, on all the, how you can have positive and negative camber, uh, the relationship between cord length. Um, so when we looked at that aerofoil, the distance along the net, the, often there's a little bit of something underneath, whether it's got negative camber or positive camber. Um, that length from there compared to this has some features that make a difference to the lift coefficients and calculating those. But we'll, we'll look at those at another time. But if you started to read through it, so Bellini's principle we've looked at, lift and drag weight, all good. Aerofoil shapes, structural integrities and stuff like that. Um, the other thing you'll find too as you look through it, you can see that um, the structure of the aircraft is uh, particularly the wings are often talked about as cantilevers. Um, so, you know, just trying to bring in beams into it. And the biggie is going to be jet engines when we get to jet engines and stuff. Okay. A couple of other things that will come up as we go is some really interesting questions like, how do you tell how fast you're going? How do you tell how fast you're going in a, in a, in a car? And the meter is controlled by what? The wheel rotation. Real rotation. So so no, no, that wouldn't work, would it? No. So there's an interesting problem. How do you know how fast you? Why do you want to know how fast you're going? Don't want to break the wall. Oh, what in an <laughs> aircraft? <laughs> yeah. Don't want to speed. No, no. All right. You're flying from one place to another, and it's night time, and you can't actually see anything to take bearings off and such. Which is why in the early times of flight, you didn't fly at night, because if you didn't have any of this, you didn't know where you were. So, yeah. So if you're flying high, you want to know how far you've flown in the time you've been in the air. So you do need to know how fast you're going. 
Right? Now, that's an interesting question because you can't just stick a wheel out and run along the ground. <laughs> All right? That's not going to work. The other one, how do you know how high you are? Yes, they do. But how do they work? So we'll be looking at those. Some interesting things in there have solving problems related to things that you never had. These problems didn't exist until people started flying. All right. How far up are you? Yeah, that's reasonably the case. Yeah, I'll give you a clue. You, you personally as a human being have one of these in you as a natural consequence of who you are. And that is the middle ear. And in the middle ear you've got a pressurizing element and you all know that you can tell that you've gone up a mountain because you go, oh, what's that? And pop. Yeah. Or blow your nose. Same for divers when they go down. So you can get a clue from that that height is going to be related to pressure. Yeah. Yeah. 